uh, on behalf of Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, I welcome you all to this evening's Achinto Kumar Tapadar Memorial Lecture. As a tradition, before the lecture starts, we read out a small life sketch of Achinto Kumar Tapadar. Accordingly, I read it. Ochintakumar Tapadar was born in a reputed family in the year 1938 at the Micha village of Asansol in the district of Badwan. He had a religious background from both the sides of his father and mother. His father, Jogesh Chandra Tapadar, was a musician and his mother, Bhola Devi, was a pious lady, encouraging her children constantly to realize the ultimate falsity of worldly life that was finally renounced by her children. Since his boyhood, Ochinto was quiet and intelligent and gentle boy who had his early education at Siar Sol Raj High School. During his studies in Asansol College, Ochinto had come in contact with Sami Vishuddhanandaji Maharaj who finally initiated him. Maharaj did also inspire him to join the order. His father, Jogesh Chandra, could not, however, accept the proposal since Ochinto was his only son. After having completed his undergraduate and postgraduate studies under the University of Calcutta, Ochinto took up teaching assignment, but nothing could put an end to his contact with Belur Mott. He was fortunate enough to come in contact with many distinguished monks of the order, including Swami Madhavanandaji, Swami Bireshwaranandaji, Swami Abhayanandaji, Swami Bhuteshanandaji, Swami Atosthanandaji. As a sincere devotee, Ochinto worked hard to spread the teachings of the Holy Trinity among students and young boys and girls at Asansol, where he had been working. Thus, in 1985, Raniganj Vivekananda Service Center was formed. He was associated with the center throughout his life. He was also a member of the general body of Belunmot and a managing committee member of the Asansol mission till death. Monks and Brahmacharins of the order were his kith and kin. He and his sisters lawfully donated their inherited and accumulated wealth to the Ramakrishna Mott, Belur Mott. Ochinto Kumar passed away in 2011 at the age of 71. Today, Ochinto Kumar Tapadar Memorial Lecture will be delivered by Dr. Gelio Pesco. He will speak in English on physics and Indian spiritual tradition. Before we start our lecture. First of all, I request Ms. Nupur Munshi to come on the stage to say something about the Dr. Pesco, who is the Indian coordinator of this chapter. And then I request Shamul Babu to come over the stage and felicitate our speaker. Thank you. Shamal Babu will come first. To first, we'll felicitate our speaker. So Shamal Babu will hand over a small memento to him. Namaskar, good evening, and a warm welcome to our distinguished uh, audience members uh, to an epoch-making episode of understanding the relationship between science, spirituality, truth, and eternity, perhaps, here at the Shivananda Hall of the Ram Krishna Mission Institute of Culture, Kolkata, India, 
It's a beautiful bonding that I have set up with RMIC and to have been bestowed upon the blessing to stand on this pedestal under the divine presence of Swami Vivekananda is perhaps a supreme achievement in India and I am deeply, deeply grateful and thankful to Srimad Shami Shupanandaji Maharaj revered secretary Ram Krishna Mission Institute of Culture for your blessing. My heartfelt gratitude to Srimad Shami Pragatmanandaji Maharaj, the Center for Indological Studies and Research and the Cultural Activities Department here at the RMIC and the whole of the Ram Krishna Mission for your support and inspiration for me to learn and work. To some of us, this is a beginning of a learning journey. Our aspiration would be to understand and then to communicate how the insights of Indian spiritual tradition can be made compatible and mutually reinforcing with those of modern physics. Revered Shami Shupanandaji Maharaj once uh, said to me that the universe around is manifestation of God. So you serve this universe very lovingly by selfless service outwardly through science and inwardly through meditation and explained the need of convergence of science and spirituality as a need for attainment of fulfillment in a way of blending the external and the internal. We are really happy and honored to have Dr. Giulio Prisco, founder Turing Church, a theoretical physicist, former systems engineer at the European Space Centers. We, and I am honored to also announce that our global community Turing Church have set up India Awakens from India and we are looking forward to be working in India with the blessings and guidance of Ram Krishna Mission to continue our journey. We want to fondly remember our dear sister, late Mrs. Rumjhum Munshi Pandit as our inspiration or maybe our sister is here with us today. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all the kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be, says the sacred Gita. In future of artificial superintelligences, science may uncover more and more the mysteries of the mind and the universe and may find for us our sister Rumjhum or all our loved ones we lost from the fabric of fundamental reality. Dr. Prisco believes that a cosmic divine mind embedded in the fabric of fundamental reality itself and of which individual minds are but pale reflections could shape the becoming of space, time particles, fields, matter, energy, life forms. The mind could remember the memory of the universe. Almost like what Tagore says, Chokher dekha, praner kotha, shei ki bhola jai, abar dekha jodi holo shakha, praner majhe ai. And nothing is uh, complete without Tagore in Bengal. Another small line, at the immortal touch of, of thy hands, my little heart loses its limits in joy and gives birth to utterance ineffable. Thank you. Dr. Gilo Prisco.
Thank you very much, Nopur, for your uh, beautiful introduction. I'd like uh, also to thank uh, the, all the organizers at the uh, Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture. It's uh, really a honor for me to be here. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank you all uh, for taking the, taking the time to come and uh, listen to me. I am expected to talk about physics and the Indian spiritual tradition, but I have to say that I don't know and don't understand Indian spiritual tradition that much. I'm basically here to learn. And I will uh, mention a lot of things in the relatively short time that I had, that I have. That means that, of course, I won't have the time to go into much detail. Uh, at the same time, well, you can read all that on my website, which is here, which is touringchurch.net. My name is Giulio Prisco, and you have also my email address here. And I will be delighted and honored if you write to me with uh, whatever observation, questions, or comment that uh, you may wish to bring to the table. Looking forward to being in touch with you all. Ah, yes, I should explain what uh, that uh, strange symbol means, but uh, that will come later. And as Nupur explained, this uh, talk is dedicated to the memory of Rumjum Monshi Pondit. Oh my, I hope I pronounced that well. I will uh, mention some uh, things that uh, concern all of us, life and death issues, like uh, what happened when we disappear, where, when, who, what do we become, and uh, as I formulate uh, these questions and uh, try to formulate uh, tentative answers, I have room zoom in mind. Where is room zoom? When is room zoom? Who or what? different concepts of uh, divinity in Western and Eastern uh, traditions. I'm going to oversimplify very much, of course, but uh, I can say that uh, in most uh, Western religions, especially Christianity, God is uh, personal. We in the West tend to have a personal concept of God. But as, as I understand, in the Eastern tradition, God is more, uh, perhaps, uh, diffuse is the correct word. A God that is uh, entangled and uh, entwined with uh, the physical universe without necessarily having uh, any personal attributes that our own consciousness can relate to. And the same applies to our concepts of self and afterlife. We have different uh, ideas and different uh, concepts of uh, afterlife in Eastern and Western uh, spiritual traditions, reincarnation, resurrection. 
nirvana, different things. And again, oversimplifying, I will uh, mm, say that uh, we in the West are very much emotionally attached to the idea of self. Mm, we are not happy thinking that uh, after death we will just uh, emerge into the universe at large, but we want to think uh, that something of our own uh, personality and individuality will persist after death. So we want to be here. Uh -oh. Uh, before moving on to other things, I want to mention that uh, also in uh, Western philosophy recently, we are starting to become more and more uh, close to some uh, concepts that we know from Eastern traditions. For example, we have uh, a theoretical framework called open individualism, which has been uh, described by Daniel Kolak, an American philosopher, in a book named I Am You. And uh, the central thesis of the book is that we are all the same person, which I believe is uh, a concept that that uh, many people from Eastern uh, spiritual traditions can relate to. We are all the same person. That uh, makes uh, scientific sense, I believe, and uh, I like to call this open individualism a minimalist theory of reincarnation, because it doesn't make many assumptions on the nature of either human consciousness or the universe at large, and uh, gives uh, an essentially acceptable, in a psychological sense, of uh, the biggest uh, questions that we ask ourselves. How can we think to persist in the afterlife? We persist in the afterlife because everyone is the same. The mental metaphor that I like to use to think of these concepts is uh, to think of a windows open on the world. Here we see that there are many windows and the point of view from this, how can I point? The point of view from this window is not exactly the same from here. There are differences. Here I see something, here I see something slightly different, here I see something slightly different. And that uh, reflects the difference between uh, different uh, persons. Okay, I am me and you are you. We are different persons, but what we have in common, we are all uh, alive on the planet Earth in year 2018. And this thing that we have in common is perhaps more important than uh, the uh, things that uh, separate us. So we have uh, uh, many windows that show different things. But we can think that there is one person looking from uh, behind the windows. So what happens if uh, what we see here disappear. For example, if we pull uh, the curtain and uh, make this specific point of view disappear, what happens? You could say not ve not uh, nothing really too unpleasant happens because I still have this point of view and I still have this point of view. So from the perspective on the one of the one mind who is uh, looking simultaneously at all the windows, 
it's not really that uh, much of a deal if the content of one window disappears because we still have all the others. This, I believe, is a nice uh, a metaphor to think uh, of uh, this uh, a minimalist idea of resurrection. Okay, now let's move on to physics, which is advancing spectacularly indeed. Uh, and to illustrate this concept, I have chosen a book that was written almost 90 years ago. A book called Mysterious Universe, published in 1930. The author mentioned the spectacular revolution that happened in physics in the first 30 years of last century with the development, uh, the first developments of Einstein's general relativity and the beginning of quantum physics. Mm. Today we could add a couple more things, for example, uh, the development of quantum field theory and uh, the standard model developments in uh, condensed matter physics. But uh, one thing seems equally valid today as 90 years ago, when uh, James James uh, pointed out that physics is not yet in contact with the ultimate reality. I think we can still say that. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what ultimate reality is. I don't know that, of course. But uh, I'm going to show you some uh, example and some uh, intriguing uh, concepts that can show how we are still far from uh, having an idea of what the ultimate reality is. And uh, perhaps the ultimate reality is uh, nothing that we could imagine at this very moment. Besides the science, we have uh, engineering and we have technology, which is also advancing exponentially. Every day we read in the news of some new technology development, and some technology development is becoming really like uh, science fiction. We can do now things that uh, would have been considered as uh, science fiction from one generation before us. This is a magic machine, and everyone has one in their pocket. With this little machine in my pocket, I can do things that my grandfather would have considered as a magic. My grandfather would have had other words for it but magic. All uh, this uh, appreciation and uh, enthusiasm for uh, what technology has done and what technology will probably continue to do is uh, described in the literature of a philosophical movement called transhumanism. Mm, I don't really have the time to define all the terms that I'm going to use, just Google things. For example, this uh, transhumanist philosophy is uh, outlined in an anthology called uh, The Transhumanist Reader. I very much recommend reading it. I very much recommend reading all the books that I'm mentioning here. Uh, transhumanists think that uh, there is no a priori limit that can be placed on the development of technology and science. And uh, using technology, future generation will be able to make uh, the world a, a magic, 
place, just like our world, would have been considered as a magic uh, place from uh, the people of a couple of generations before. So, science is advancing and technology is advancing. We will come back to the interaction between science and technology. Now, I want to mention a newcomer in scientific theology, which is called the simulation hypothesis. It's the idea that uh, some of you may be familiar with in its naive formulation that basically says that our uh, world and our reality is a video game which is being uh, run on uh, some kind of uh, hypercomputers in a hyperreality, in higher dimension or something like that. There are much less naive way to, ways to formulate uh, the concept and I'm going to come back to this later. Uh, I want to mention the fact that uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk, the guy, the very famous technology entrepreneur who last week uh, send his uh, sport uh, car to outer space. I'm sure uh, many of you have uh, watched the launch of Falcon Heavy. So Elon Musk, who is uh, a star technologist and uh, one of the best known uh, people in the technology world, once said that uh, he very much believes in the simulation hypothesis based on a counting argument. Um, I mean, you just have to Google that. Basically, he said that uh, uh, the number of uh, possible simulated realities is uh, much bigger than the number of possible physical realities, and therefore the probability that we live in a simulated reality is much higher. I don't really buy that argument, but, uh, you know, when somebody like Elon Musk says something, at least he deserves being uh, listened to. The point that I want to stress here is that uh, the simulation hypothesis is completely equivalent to a Western religion. In particular, it is completely equivalent to Christianity. It's not similar, not uh, a little bit like, not very, not very much like, no, it's exactly the same thing as Christianity. We have uh, creators who have created a universe and can uh, uh, run the universe according to their intentions. They can, if they want, violate uh, the physical laws of their simulated universe, which has not necessarily the same laws of their home universe, but uh, they could do whatever they want, acting in our reality, which from their point of view is a computation, and uh, in particular they could uh, uh, grant everyone an afterlife according to any framework they can think of. So we have a creator who is uh, presumably omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. And this is uh, the simplest formulation of the Western religion of Christianity. We can think of simulation theology. Again, my message here is that this family of uh, speculative theologies is exactly equivalent to Christianity and very similar to other religions. Now let's uh, make an example of what I mean by simulation. Simulation, computation, I mean we are all familiar with video games in which we can create realities, but let's consider something simple. Let's consider a simple cellular automa, automata, like uh, the well-known uh, game of life 
invented by British mathematician John Conway. Here we have some very simple rules of evolution, which says what will happen to one cell. For example, we have a white cell here. At the next time step, the cell can stay white or can become uh, a black. We, this is a simple universe of black and white cells. And there is a very simple mathematical way to compute the future from the past. In fact, this is the symbol that I had on uh, my very first view graph, which is a life uh, pattern that evolves in time growing to infinity is an infinite growth pattern it starts chaotic then you know, it starts moving and leaves behind a wake that uh, could be seen as a DNA shaped helix I like very much this symbol because it has all the things that uh, it has really all the things that I'm discussing. And uh, that's also the evolution of biological life. We can have uh, a very simple simulated physics able to generate something that looks like life. And in fact, uh, John Conway himself thought that given a life mathematical space uh, which is big enough, it uh, is perfectly plausible to think that intelligent life could evolve in this simulated universe. Eventually, intelligent species might evolve from the same sort of selected uh, pressures that operated on Earth. The modern science of cellular autom automata has been developed by many mathematicians. Uh, most notably, Stephen Wolfram has uh, written uh, a very thick book, the book is literally that thick, about uh, 15 years ago, called A New Kind of Science. But uh, he thinks that uh, cellular automata could be a model for how fundamental physics works, in the sense that uh, the machinery behind space time and the structure, the fabric of reality, could be something that looks like a cellular automata or a more uh, sophisticated version, perhaps based on uh, uh, graph and network theory. Uh, this Two people that I mentioned here, uh, American mathematician uh, Ralph Abraham and Indian physicist Cecil Roy, have uh, frequently visited the Ramakrishna Institute. And uh, they have written a book a few years ago called Demystifying the Akash where they elaborate on a concept similar to uh, Wolfram's idea to look for a discrete cellular automata-like model behind the scenes of uh, everyday reality, as we know. Uh, what's interesting here is that uh, the model seems uh, to leave enough room for the concept of a permanent memory of the universe. 
some information store where all the information that has ever been produced in the universe continues to be stored. And it is the concept that uh, you teach me that has been called Akashic records in ancient uh, traditions. So physics is uh, beginning somehow to move toward that. This is one of the main concepts that I'm mentioning tonight. Physics is beginning to move toward the different forms of uh, ancient wisdom. For example, quantum physics. We have, been, uh, we have known of uh, quantum physics for almost 120 years now, but quantum physics is still mysterious. And uh, Nobel Prize winner Richard Feynman says once that uh, if you don't think that quantum physics is mysterious, that means you don't understand it. For example, is uh, something a particle or a wave? Uh, quantum uh, particles sometimes appear as particles and sometimes they appear as waves, waves in ways that uh, no one is able to understand intuitively. How can something be both a square and a circle? Mm, well, as a matter of fact, something can be both a square and a circle because a three-dimensional object, meaning something more uh, complex than what can be captured in two-dimensional geometry can have both a square and a circular projection. And this is a good metaphor to think of quantum physics uh, too. I mean, it's not a particle, it's not a wave, it's something else, but it's something that our uh, two-dimensional imagination is not able to visualize. And this is a way to make sense of the fact that quantum physics is mysterious. It is mysterious because we are, we are not uh, uh, meant to think in uh, uh, these terms. One of the most uh, frequently mentioned mysteries of quantum physics is entanglement. That is that uh, <coughs> phenomenon which uh, creates uh, instant correlation between things separated far away. Instant correlation that uh, seems to propagate faster than light, even though it can be demonstrated that it is impossible to exploit entangle the correlation to actually exchange information. So causality and relativity is uh, still safe, but the correlations are still there. And uh, they have been uh, found not only theoretically, but also experimentally in uh, many labs around the world. There is a metaphor that helps us think of uh, Entangled correlation. This is an example due to physicist uh, David Bohm, one of the founding fathers of the second wave of quantum physics development. So there is a magic fish. A magic uh, couple of fishes and uh, what is magic is that when the first fish does something, the second fish does the same thing. It can be turning right or turning left. The two fishes are correlated, and uh, this correlation is independent of uh, the distance and seems to actuate faster than light. Uh, this seems uh, very mysterious, but as a matter of fact, this whole setup uh, is not mysterious because the two fishes 
that we thought of initially as different fishes are actually two images of the same fish. We had just one fish, two video cameras uh, looking at both and uh, showing the fish on two different screens from two different points of view. So if this one turns left, of course this one will also turn left because they are one and the same fish. And this is a useful way to think of some situations that we encounter in quantum physics. And I'm sure many of you people must have heard about uh, many words like uh, interpretations of quantum physics. Since uh, quantum physics does not uh, really decide exactly what will happen in a given physical situation, it only offers uh, probabilities, not definite outcomes, we can think that uh, many different realities coexist, like, you know, different sheets of paper, each with a different history written on it. And uh, the universe could be a multiverse with many different realities existing in parallel, <coughs> or it could be one single universe, one single sheet of paper, but in this case, uh, then we would have to uh, have uh, an idea of how the decision is made and who makes that decision. And here, uh, let me quote uh, another founding fathers, but this time of the first wave of quantum physics, Erwin Schrödinger who uh, said that the choice is made by mind, but at this point the question becomes whose mind? My mind? Your mind? It can't be. And in fact, the choice is made by the one mind, of which uh, our uh, individual minds are uh, reflections. Well, uh, I didn't have uh, too much space, so I only mentioned uh, uh, Schrödinger here, but as a matter of fact, a lot of the founders of quantum physics said exactly this. And it uh, boils down to a concept that uh, I believe is uh, commonplace in uh, Indian spiritual traditions, that uh, Atman, the personal self, and Brahman, the omnipresent, all-comprehending eternal self, are essentially the same thing. And I only mentioned Schrödinger for short, but a lot of scientists are uh, saying that more and more. Okay, let's uh, come uh, to one of the newest family of uh, scientific theories that uh, is developing very fast is the theory of uh, condensed matter systems like you know superfluid and uh, superconductors, exotic matter which uh, can be considered as a quantum matter because these are systems where long-range coherent quantum effects become important and uh, you can think that all the constituents of uh, quantum uh, matter uh, know what all the rest of the material is doing by entanglement. Look at this picture, you see some small things like errors and the organized behavior of these uh, uh, small things gives rise to uh, big things. 
a matter of fact, I mean, nobody, not everyone has glasses. But now I can see the small things. If I take my glasses out, I can only see the big things. Which makes us think that uh, perhaps what we see and what our scientific instruments see, the big things, are uh, something that emerges from the organized behavior of something smaller. And there are theories that that's exactly how our brain works. The process of uh, a memory and consciousness formation in the brain is a result of quantum behavior, intrinsically quantum behavior, of uh, the matter that constitutes the brain. So the brain can be considered as a form of quantum matter. There are some uh, physical theories which seem to say that space-time itself could be considered as quantum matter. As a matter of fact, the concept is not as uh, uh, strange as it could seem. It has been uh, known for uh, uh, decades that there are some very strong similarities and analogies between condensed matter physics and uh, fundamental physics in the vacuum. A very highly recommended book called uh, The Universe in a Helium uh, Droplets makes a very convincing case that uh, the physics that we see could be nothing but uh, the behavior of a microphysical world that we don't see yet. And uh, this unknown microphysics of the quantum vacuum could uh, make uh, empty space-time itself behave as a quantum matter. Now, look at this picture. We see uh, ghosts, big ghosts. And we see small things here. The idea is that this, the a ghost world is our world. Uh, what we see are these uh, ghost-like formations, particles and fields, the gravitational field itself. All this uh, emerges from an underlying substrate for microphysics that uh, we do not perceive at this moment. So, the fabric of space-time, empty space-time itself, could behave like quantum matter, which means that we have, uh, if uh, all these ideas are correct, we have similar physics in the brain and in the vacuum, and we could have mind-like processes in the quantum vacuum itself. Uh, I'm not going to focus on this point, just let me mention the fact that uh, the chain doesn't have to end here. We can have one level of reality uh, below another level of reality, and one more below, and all uh, new forms of matter all the way down. But let's come back to the point. If the same physics happen in the vacuum as it happens in the brain, then we could have intelligence in the fabric of space-time itself. And this intelligence could become super-intelligence very fast. All these things, uh, uh, quantum fields and uh, particle physics is much faster than biology. So it is uh, plausible to think that evolution could take place much faster in this realm and lead to the emergence of a godlike mind in the very structure of space-time itself, of which our mind is a part. Our small mind is a part of the big mind encoded in the structure of reality, 
And that gives a plausible answer to the question of what happens after that. After that, our mind leaks a, a back into the big mind of which it really always was a part. And this seems like uh, a logically very sound solution to the question of what comes after that. Only that, as I said at the beginning, for us in the West it doesn't, uh, it doesn't sound that good. I don't want to think that I will continue to live as a, a part of a supermind. I'd like to think that I will continue to live as myself. And perhaps also many of you feel uh, the same way. There is this concept of uh, an abstract, impersonal God encoded in the fabric of space-time. Here uh, there is a, a local, very famous scientist born in Kolkata named uh, Mani Baumek, I hope I pronounce it right. He's a very famous person and he wrote a very good book where he basically describes the same idea that I just uh, described of an impersonal mind encoded in space-time. Well, of course, he wrote it much better than I could ever hope to do. But this is still an impersonal God. Something abstract, something diffuse, uh, is not a God that we can relate to emotionally. But perhaps the cosmic god can learn from life. This is a concept that is explained very well. It's one of the master masterpieces of science fiction literature ever. It's a star maker by Olaf Stapledon. I cannot give you a synopsis of the book in a couple of minutes, but what happens at the end of the book is that a god starts learning from his creations and becomes also a personal god. Now I want to make an analogy here and I hope my analogy is not too disrespectful. Uh, the, my analogy is that, that perhaps the relation between God and man is the same kind of relation that uh, we have uh, with our dogs. A dog is not at home in the city environment with cars and uh, things uh, for which a dog is not prepared. But man takes care of dogs. I'm much more uh, complicated than uh, uh, my dogs. They won't, uh, well, they won't understand anything of what I'm saying now, for example. They don't understand my world. But having had dogs for a long time, I have uh, learned how to make myself understood from dogs. So even if they cannot rise to my level, I know how to descend to their levels and make myself understood to them. I can understand my dog within some limits and uh, my dog understands me within some limits. So if the God of the cosmos becomes a personal God and if he loves us, then perhaps a personal loving and caring dog could uh, provide a personal afterlife. Just think that God carves a little door for a dog to go out. And this little dog is you and I. And perhaps there is a God that does that. No, I think I have talked too much of science and forgot uh, engineering, which is also one of the main topics of this talk. And, uh, well, one of the symbols of uh, Western technology 
is uh, Nikola Tesla, who said that uh, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more uh, progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries. Uh, of course, I have to qualify one of Tesla's statements. Uh, Non-physical phenomena does not mean phenomena that cannot be studied by physics. It means uh, phenomena that cannot be studied by physics as we know physics today. The idea is that uh, physics will permit understanding more and more of the world, including those aspects of the world that we can only call non-physical today. Uh, I think this uh, quest for Akashic engineering, how I call it, to use uh, engineering to, I don't want to say I invade, to use engineering to become closer to fundamental reality is, I believe, an ideal fusion of Eastern and Western thinking. And perhaps our uh, condensed matter engineers will be able to build real worlds into new forms of quantum matter. which is something that uh, is very much discussed in uh, a Mormon theology. There is uh, this contemporary Mormon scholar who said that the end point of engineering knowledge may be diving knowledge. We will learn how to understand God and uh, within limits we will learn how to act like a God through science and technology. In Mormon theology, I mean, there is a difference between God and man, but that difference is not as uh, huge as uh, in other theologies. Basically, in Mormonism, uh, God was once like man, is today, and uh, conversely, man could become like God. Mormonism is not uh, well known even in uh, uh, even in Europe and even in most of the United States. As a matter of fact, uh, most Mormons live in uh, Utah, around Salt Lake City. Now, let me mention you that. It, uh, I arrived in Kolkata two days ago and I noticed that there is a part of Kolkata that is called Salt Lake City, I believe. And I was like, whoa, that, uh, I've been to Salt Lake City many times to speak at uh, conferences organized by the Mormon Transhumanist Association. That's the first serendipity that I want to mention. Another interesting data point is that uh, my, good Fred, uh, my good friend Lincoln uh, Cannon, who is one of the founders of this Mormon Transhumanist Association, once said that if he wasn't a Mormon, he would be a Hinduist. And uh, he says that he still thinks that because he can see many fundamental parallels between Mormonism and Hinduism. It's uh, interesting to think and speculate about that. I think I'm coming to the end and I only have five minutes left, so I want to rush a bit, but uh, there is this uh, very intriguing philosophy that was uh, developed between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century by a group of thinkers known as Russian Cosmists. The, uh, one of the best known is uh, Nikolai Fedorov, but even better known 
is his uh, student, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, known as the father of uh, modern, modern astronautics in Russia and in the rest of the world as well. The Russian cosmists can be seen as Christian transhumanists and uh, the main themes in cosmist thought include the active human role in human and cosmic evolution, the creation of new life forms, and the physical resurrection of the dead. So seeing resurrection as uh, a scientific objective that could be achieved through engineering is uh, the big uh, gifts that uh, the Russian cosmists have done to humanity and uh, I think that they were a real uh, precursor to today transhumanist movement but much more than that as a matter of fact the cosmists were much more radical and visionary than today's transhumanists So putting all together, the idea is that through science and technology we will gain access to deeper reality, a breaking out from the sphere of reality in which we have been confined so far, and gaining access to another part of reality that we do not perceive right now but that we will perceive in the future and within this uh, a deeper reality there will be the answers to the big questions that we ask ourselves today including the question where is Rumjum? The idea is that using science and technology we will become cosmic engineers in God's control room, transform the universe and uh, resurrect uh, the dead. And I think uh, we are uh, I finished exactly on time. I would like to thank you very much and remind you that uh, my website and my emails are written here. I will be very happy to receive uh, comments and questions from everyone, but perhaps uh, we do have uh, a little bit of time for questions now, in which case uh, I will be delighted to do my best to answer. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much for this you know, thought stimulating talk. Thank you very much. Now it's open for questions and interactions for the next few minutes. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. We'll try to pass on the microphone to you so that your questions is heard by everybody. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your talk, uh, Dr. Prisco. Now, uh, you have said that Nikola uh, Tesla has talked about non-physical uh, aspects. By non-physical, uh, does he mean uh, metaphysical? This is my first question, and yes. I don't know what he meant, but I have offered my own interpretation 
of what he meant and uh, knowing what I know about uh, Nikola Tesla I think my interpretation is correct by non-physical he just meant uh, things that physics doesn't understand today but I believe uh, as uh, most scientists he did not uh, place uh, an arbitrary limit on what science can or cannot understand and I guess he thought that if science doesn't understand something today then perhaps science will understand it tomorrow I think. Uh, second question is what is the in physics what is the correlation between mind matter and energy? Well, of course, you understand that I cannot answer your question because I don't know. Uh, it's still a uh, work in progress. It's what uh, scientists are uh, trying uh, to understand. Uh, one, thing that, one thing that can be said, one thing that should be said, is that uh, many experts used to think that mind was just a simple mechanical byproduct of uh, a matter that uh, follows uh, the deterministic laws, which are basically those of uh, Newtonian physics. But uh, today's scientists are beginning to understand that things are not uh, probably that simple and that a mind may not be only a byproduct of matter but uh, there could be feedback loops between mind and matter that make uh, the old things uh, non-linear and not explainable by a simple Newtonian model so again, uh, is a work in progress that we haven't completed yet, but uh, the answer uh, promises to be very interesting. More, more questions? Oh, I have one. Okay. I will come to you later. See, as per Indian tradition, uh, we have got uh, the idea of supermind. Now, as mm. you, you know, <laughs> as, as we have seen, that God's uh, control. I'm sorry, said I had this code. Could you just say it again? No, but we have got a tradition of supermind. Supermind. Supermind, <laughs> which is beyond mind. I mean, uh, that that is uh, that will come in due course of evolution, which has not yet come. Now you, you were showing that God's control room where uh, some engineering process will take place. What is the, exactly the engineering process and what will be that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, what type of mind will control that process? That I would like to know. Whether that is uh, of that nature of super mind. Yes, it would, uh, it would have to be something much more advanced than our own mind now, of course. And for this reason, is, uh, I mean, it's uh, very difficult for us to imagine how a mind more evolved than ours work. Mm, uh, just like for uh, a dog, going back to my analogy, it's difficult to understand our mind. The reality is that uh, the vast, the, what we think and uh, what we do and why we do the things that we do would not be understandable to a dog. And I think that's it. Uh, we will evolve very gradually or perhaps very fast toward a supermind, but uh, we cannot uh, understand yet what it is like to be a supermind. We will have to get there first, and then we will understand. Dr. Prisco, I, I have studied Mormonism a bit, 
but I didn't quite get the relationship we tried to establish bet between Mormonism, Mormonism and the Indian uh, religious philosophy. Can you explain a bit part that, please? Yes, I can uh, only repeat to you the explanation that Lincoln Cannon gave to me when I asked him uh, exactly the same question, because I also didn't see very many parallels. Well, first, uh, um, you teach me that uh, Hinduism is a polytheistic religion, right? You have a concept of one god, but we also have concepts of uh, 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 many more gods. So we have both one big god and many little dogs. Oh my, I, I must have said a very stupid things, but I believe you all understand what I mean. And uh, in Mormonism, there is exactly the same concept, which is uh, besides the god with uppercase G of religion, there can be evolved, super evolved and exalted beings which are halfway between man and God. And the degree of uh, Godhead can uh, change in time in the process of evolution of the mind. So something, and perhaps humanity itself, can become like God and uh, take uh, a place in this uh, hierarchy of gods that exist in the universe. More questions? I think in, uh, in that case, yeah. just a second. This is not a question, but an observation, sir. Uh, Bushman says that engineers are trying to create humans who would be able to act like God. But in uh, molecular genetics and also in molecular biology, there are lots of genes who have expressions and these gene expressions cannot be changed by the scientists. It is not <coughs> possible for them yet. There are lots of things in uh, the abiotic world which cannot be changed or influenced by humans so far. And I don't know, maybe uh, it will continue like this for next hundred years or so. So. Well, maybe, but I think you said uh, yourself the key word, and the key word is yet. No, I didn't say that. What yes, you did. You just, you just did. I, I didn't follow what you said. Uh, uh, the key word is yet. As you said yourself, we cannot yet do yes, many things, but that doesn't mean that uh, we won't be able to do all these things tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I thank all of you, in particular, the speaker again. You know. Yes, uh, I do thank all of you, you know, for coming here, and the speaker particularly for this very thought-provoking talk. And uh, so we should give him, you know, another big clap, you know. Thank you very much to you all.